Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our very first TTP talk. We are so excited to have you with us here this evening. My name is Tisha Tan. I'm a community outreach and education coordinator here at Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, otherwise known as TRCA, and I will be facilitating our program tonight. TTP Talks is a free speaker series all about Toronto's urban wilderness, TTP, also known as Tommy Thompson Park. And as part of TTP Talks, each virtual event will cover a different topic related to the park. So again, welcome. We're really, really excited to talk to you about this park that we all you know, love and, and hold close to our hearts. So I'll get us started with a little bit of housekeeping as we wait for more folks to come and join us this evening. If you are joining our webinar on a mobile device, you can actually swipe on the screen between the slide view and the webcam view. So if you can't see my slides right now and you can only see our faces, um, feel free to test out that function. As you are joining, everyone here has been muted to limit background noise, but that doesn't mean that we don't wanna hear from you. So there are a couple ways that you can interact with us over the course of the evening. Um, we have uh, two functions that have been turned on, the first being our webinar chat, and the other being our question and answer. So if you have any questions for our panelists today, you can enter those questions into the Q&A box. Um, and what we'll do is we'll collect the questions and answer them uh, during the live Q&A session that we're going to host at the end of all of our speakers' talks here today. Um, you can also put any comments that you might have or any questions um, that you might have regarding like technical difficulties you're experiencing in the chat. Um, I will be monitoring both the Q&A and the chat over the course of the evening. So you can put comments and technical difficulty questions in the, in the chat box. The last thing I will mention um, is that this webinar is being recorded. Um, your, none of your cameras will be on, so you, your face won't end up in any of this recording, but the recording is essentially going to be shared in a follow-up email so that you can share it with folks who um, maybe in your networks who were unable to join us today. So you'll expect a follow-up email in the next few days um, with a link to the recording once we're um, able to upload it to our website. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention is that in the Q&A box, we've turned on this feature that allows you to upvote questions that you like. So if you have a question in mind and then you go into the Q question and answer box and you notice someone else has asked the same question that you like, you can upvote the questions so that we can prioritize them on the back end. Okay. To start, even though we are geographically dispersed in an online environment today, I do want to begin by recognizing that wherever we are, we all work, live, and gather on traditional Indigenous territory. Now, when we do a land acknowledgement at the begin uh, beginning of an event like this, it's an opportunity for us to take a moment and reflect on who we are, what our relationship is with the land, as well as our own intentions. For gathering here today. And so I hope that we can all take this moment to reflect on these things. As part of this reflection, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the lands that TTP and TRCA are located on are traditional territories and treaty lands, in particular those of the Mississaugas of the Credit, as well as the Anishinaabeg of the Williams Treaty First Nations, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that these lands are also the traditional territories of many non-human living things who have equally been impacted by the arrival of settlers on Turtle Island. We must remember that we share this land and all of its gifts with these living things, as well as understand that we all have a responsibility to give back as much as is being given to us. Through our work with land and water resources within the Greater Toronto Region, TRCA appreciates and respects the history and diversity of the land. We're really grateful to have the opportunity to work and meet in this territory. And we're also really grateful for the continued work of many Indigenous peoples who are the original caretakers of this land. And we humbly acknowledge our responsibility to respect Indigenous perspectives and elevate Indigenous voices. So we invite you to uh, acknowledge the Indigenous territories and treaty lands in your local area 
and encourage you to learn a little bit more about them and explore um, the interactive map at native-land.ca. It's a fantastic tool. Okay, so this is a brief look at our agenda for this evening. Um, for this first TTP talk, talk we're talking about the creation um, and what it takes to um, put together and build this wonderful, unique urban wilderness of TTP. So um, we're gonna start off by talking about the history and construction, then we'll go into master plan and management of the park, the ecological significance of the park, and then round things off talking about education and engagement outreach initiatives. Then, like I mentioned, at the very end, we'll have a live Q&A session to address some of the questions that have come through the question and answer box. And here is our look at our speakers for this evening. Um, our first speaker is Karen McDonald, who will be speaking about the history and construction of TTP. Karen is a senior manager on the ecosystem management team, and she has been working at TTP since 2003. Andrea Creston will be speaking to the master plan and the management of the park. She is the senior project manager on the ecosystem management team and has been working at TTP since 2007. Our third speaker this evening is Hilary Stead. Hilary is an environmental technologist here at TRCA and has been working at TTP since 2017. So she'll be reviewing the ecological significance of the park. And then finally, we have Jasmine Thompson, who is a coordinator on the Community Outreach and Education team here at TRCA. And she's been working here since 2018. Um, she will be speaking to us about education and engagement at TTP. So without further ado, I'll pass things on over to Karen. Thank you, Tisha. Let me share my screen. Hopefully you are all seeing my screen right now. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So let me preface this by saying that I am not an expert on waterfront history. I have drawn heavily from a few sources, and I'd like to say an advance thank you to Wayne Reeves, the now retired Chief Curator of Museums and Heritage Services at the City of Toronto, various archives, including the Toronto Public Library in Ports Toronto, and to the Lost Rivers of Toronto Project. Any errors or omissions that are in this presentation are mine and mine alone. Toronto's waterfront has a very rich history, and I'm only going to focus on two locations in the central waterfront, the Toronto Islands and Ashbridge's Bay Park, as they are central to the Tommy Thompson Park story. And this history will focus on post-European arrival. So prior to the establishment of the city of Toronto, the lands along the waterfront were once composed of dense forest and marsh ecosystems. Toronto Islands has its own complex history worthy of its own webinar series, but I'm only gonna scratch the surface here. The islands were originally a sand spit that were formed over thousands of years from deposits from the Scarborough Bluffs. This material was transported via water currents. The map that you see on screen is a map from 1815 from Joseph Bouchette. And on this map, you can see the islands, which are not actually islands, as well as the marsh on the right side. The painting is by Caroline Simcoe in 1793, and it is looking west from about the mouth of the John River over to the islands. The entire area around the islands, including Ashbridge's Bay Marsh, which I will talk about next, were incredibly important for the Indigenous peoples that lived on these lands, as well as the first European settlers to arrive. In 1852, a storm cut through the peninsula, but that was filled in and the connection to the mainland restored. Then, six years later, another storm created a much larger and permanent gap of what is now known as the Eastern Gap. This is a map from 1908, and you can see the Eastern Gap sort of at the, the bottom part of that image. And then if I flip to what the islands look like today, this is a Google Earth image from 2023. About 15 islands now comprise this archipelago, and the construction of the Leslie Street Spit, or Tommy Thompson Park, has interrupted the sand supply, resulting in erosion and subsequent erosion control projects. And you can see that at the left of the islands, on the very west side, we have the Gibraltar Point Project. 
Now, if I zoom to the east a little bit, the delta where the Don River once flowed into Lake Ontario was extremely rich in biodiversity. It provided habitat for hundreds of species of flora and fauna across about a 560 hectare marsh complex. It was the, one of the largest marshes in eastern Canada, and it was known as Ashbridge's Marsh after the first settlers east of the Don River. The marsh extended from what is now Woodbine Avenue all the way over to Cherry Street. The southern limit of the marsh was that sandy peninsula that was shown on the previous slide that was formed from the depositional materials from the Scarborough Bluffs, and the remnants today are Cherry Beach and the Toronto Islands. This marsh provided rich fishing, hunting, and trapping areas. Marsh vegetation was harvested in the winter to provide marsh hay for livestock bedding and for mattress stuffing. It was also important for, for recreation with boating, ice skating, and fishing. The marsh provided ice, which was especially important in the days before refriger refrigeration. And this is a photo from 1904, which arguably is after the marsh had been considerably degraded by human use. But as you can see, see it is still a coastal wetland. This is an 1882 map by Mayor McMurrich. I'm choosing to show this map because although it has less topographic detail than other maps, it's a really nice portrayal of Ashbridge's Bay from a time before this water body was altered by people. And you can see the inclusion of the creeks on the map, which of course are all now buried today. Those are to the east of the Don River. The marsh became quite polluted. It was mostly from animal and human waste. There was a significant contribution from the nearby Gooderham and Warts distillery, which used waste grain to fatten cows and pigs. And up to 80,000 gallons of liquid manure per day were drained directly into this marsh. In the early 1890s, a cholera outbreak loomed and the city threatened the distillery with legal action, which resulted in a waste filtration system being implemented. Also in the late 1890s, the Keating Channel was built along the north edge of the marsh to improve the circulation of waters in the marsh, but it did nothing to address the sewage pollution. And the lithograph picture on the left side of the screen is the area around uh, Ashbridge's Marsh in 1896. And you can see that it was indeed very bustling. And this of course is an image of the area today. You can see in the right side of the screen what is now Ashbridge's Bay. Enter the Toronto Harbour Commission, which was formed in 1911 to create a modern port, industrial sector, and recreational areas. There were growing public health concerns, and the need for a new port and industrial lands led to the creation of the Ash Bridges Bay Reclamation Scheme, which was at the time the largest engineering project in North America. The Harbour Commission created a waterfront development master plan, which was meant to have industrial lands, parks, and places for summer homes, which you can see in the 1912 plan on the screen. It actually retains a little bit of the marshland, which is shown for recreation and those summer homes. In 1914, the filling of the marsh was started, and it was supported by all levels of government at the time. By 1922, the marsh had been completely filled in to create an additional 200 hectares of land, and by 1930, the whole area was known as the Port Industrial District. The 1912 plan did not proceed much beyond the filling of Ashbridge's Marsh, and multiple versions of waterfront development were proposed through the decades. The Harbour Commission updated the plan in 1949 and proposed substantial filling and mooring areas which were protected by an offshore breakwater that you can see in the image on the screen. This was published in the Toronto Daily Star in March 1949. You'll notice that this plan also removes references to parkland and summer homes. We only have now industrial lands. The Harbour Commission then spent the 50s studying lake filling options, and then in 1959, the St. Lawrence Seaway opened. The St. Lawrence Seaway is a system of locks, canals, and channels that allow ocean vessels to travel from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Great Lakes. And in 1960, finally, this Outer Harbour project was formally adopted by the Harbour Commission. The seaway opening, as well as the intense development 
in the city brought a renewed vigor to lake filling and material was again dumped into the lake, this time at the foot of Leslie Street to create land what is known as the Outer Harbor East Headland. The image, the ortho orthophotograph image on the right uh, shows um, uh, that area prior to filling occurring in 1959. Where the filling first occurred is now known as the baseland, and they were created over about 14 years. Source material from the baselands possibly came from Regent Park South, St. Jamestown, the Bloor Danforth subway from Keel to Woodbine, the Young University subway extension from Union to St. George, Toronto's new city hall, as well as the Toronto Dominion Centre. Demolition rubble, bricks, concrete, and asphalt, as well as excavation materials, subsoil, and bedrock, likely predominated the fill materials, but non-controlled fill and miscellaneous solid waste meant a wide variety of material was deposited. In fact, an archaeological survey of the 1964 fill area found household debris, personal items, and even food waste. In total, about nine and a half million cubic meters of material was used to create the baselands, including contaminated materials, which I'll talk about in a little bit. After the baselands were completed, construction of the spine began. Construction offered an inexpensive and convenient way to deal with the development of the industry's byproducts. Using waste materials allowed the construction of a breakwater at about 6% of the cost of a conventional breakwater, so a very small fraction of the price. And during this period, almost any waste was accepted, including incinerator residue, battery casings, coal ash, and dredge sediment. The second phase of construction was initi initiated in 1973 when the outer harbor was dredged to maintain a shipping channel. This two-year project consisted of the deposition of over 7 million cubic meters of silty sand material on the city side of the spine. And you can see in the bottom right image, the hydraulic dredging underway, which is sort of like an underwater vacuum. This created the four peninsulas that we know at the park today, and this is an important part of the construction history since they were constructed very differently from the rest of the park. Around this time, the site also became known as the Leslie Street Spit. It was also in the 1970s that it became apparent that the spit was not needed for port-related industry. And in 1972, the federal government promised parkland as the outcome of a new port strategy for Toronto. And Andrea will outline this further in her slides on the master plan process. By 1979, the headland was almost its final length, extending about 4.4 kilometers from the baselands and receiving 1,600 truckloads a day, which meant it was growing at a rate of three and a half meters a day. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between Canada and the U.S., which was signed in 1972 and then revised again in 1978, banned the open water disposal of polluted dredge material. So the Toronto Harbour Commission designed a plan to create three confined disposal facilities, CDFs, or we also refer to them as cells, at the spit. The CDFs received material dredge from Toronto's harbour and it's still in operation today. We'll talk more about confined disposal facilities and the innovative habitat creation that TRCA spearheaded in the next webinar. The creation of the indictment encloses the three CDFs and helps protect the rest of the landform from erosion. Material from the indictment possibly came from the St. Lawrence neighbourhood, Village by the Grange, Atrium on Bay and the Scotia Plaza projects. In these images, you can see that the indictment has only really just started and only cell one has been created. Next, we move into the 1990s uh, and the Toplands project, was, which was initiated in the early 2000s. Lake filling at the spit continued until 2015 when Ports Toronto were accepting only bricks and rubble. Soils were not permitted at the time. The Toplands project was undertaken to address erosion, but also to provide opportunities for more fill material and what would become later important habitat for wildlife. And there will be future lake filling required to address erosion since the park has no formal shoreline protection. And the last slide I want to leave you with is just this overview of the construction timeline because it did take place over such a long period of time. 
Now I'll hand it over to Andrea to talk about master planning. Great, thanks, Karen. Just getting set up. Okay, so through my presentation and my talk about the master plan, I'm going to switch between probably referring to the site as the Eastern Headland, as well as referring to it as the Leslie Street Spit or the Spit. So all of these names are are referring to the same landform. Um, so just if there's any confusion. <laughs> All right. Okay. So in the first half of the 20th century, the Toronto waterfront was an industrial area not easily accessible or programmed for public use. A change was first proposed in the 1967 waterfront plan that had a vision to return the waterfront back to park and recreational opportunities. In 1968, the Toronto Harbour Commissioners released a plan called the Bold Concept. This saw significant parkland south of the Gardner Expressway within the Toronto Harbour. Bold Concept did not extend to the Eastern Headland or the Spit as it was still planned for port related infrastructure at that time. Metro Toronto and Region Conservation Authority became involved in waterfront projects in, the in 1970 when the Ministry of Environment delegated us to implement the waterfront plan. This responsibility included all areas of the waterfront except for the harbour where Toronto Harbour Commissioners was still the lead. As the peninsulas were being created along, uh, on the east Eastern Headland in 1972, the Toronto Harbour Commissioners released a conceptual plan for aquatic park, a public park on these new lands. This was the first time in this era that a public park was considered for the East Headland. The Conservation Authority's responsibility for the waterfront plan was extended to include the Central Harbour and the Aquatic Park Master Plan process in 1973. Toronto Harbour Commissioners was still responsible for the on-the-ground operations of the Eastern Headland or the Spit and started a weekend public access program. Public process was undertaken to develop the Aquatic Park Master Plan. When the planning began in 1973, the peninsulas were just beginning, uh, just being created and it was essentially a blank slate. The vision was to create a waterfront park for visitors of all ages and with interests as diverse as bird watching and water skiing. Over 150 uses were suggested for the park and the master plan study process narrowed it down to unique activities and facilities that would complement other waterfront parks. There was strong emphasis on water related activities and boat facilities as this was a regional planning priority. The Aquatic Park Master Plan released, uh, was released, sorry, the Aquatic Park Master Plan released in 1976 and the concept was approved by the Conservation Authority's Waterfront Advisory Board. It was then forwarded to the province for approval. So this is the Aquatic Park Master Plan. Um, it was developed to address the need for parkland as well as boating and sailing facilities on the Toronto waterfront. It featured mixed recreational uses, including boating and sailing, camping, walking and biking trails, water skiing, an amphitheater, and a landlocked swimming lake. It also maintained a natural area for wildlife and nature interpretation at the tip or the area down near the lighthouse. Plans were included for a formal water ski facility and a marine land amusement park on a future fill area on the lake side. You'll note that this conceptual fill area did not occur. So with the Aquatic Park Master Plan approved, Metro Toronto and Region Conservation Authority was given the responsibility of interim management and master plan site development in 1977. However, immediate site development was delayed due to changes to Toronto Harbour Commissioner's construction schedule for the Eastern Headland, as well as funding and changing existing conditions due to natural succession. At the same time, the Toronto Harbour Commissioners formalized the public uh, access as a summer program with park transportation provided by the TPC, as there was no private vehicle access to the headland during public hours, and allowed for the establishment of Aquatic Park Sailing Club on Peninsula D as per the Aquatic Park Master Plan. By 1983, the site conditions were drastically different. 
Through natural succession, the lands had evolved to an environmentally significant area, and the Conservation Authority's direction had changed to prioritize the protection and management of important natural habitats in waterfront planning projects. So a new master planning process was initiated, and there was a commitment to include public participation in all stages. We'll get into more detail on the stages in a few slides. In the meantime, a couple key things happened in 1984. Ownership of the aquatic park lands was officially transferred to Metro Toronto and Region Conservation Authority from the province, and the Conservation Authority assumed the interim management program that had been implemented by the Toronto Harbour Commissioners to date. The summer public program was then extended to be offered year round to include nature interpretation and a seasonal transportation system. So this just provides some context. The image on the left shows the in 1975 when the peninsulas are just about completed and on the right is 1982. So there's a clear difference in the vegetation cover and the amount of natural succession that took place in this seven year period. Now also in 1984, Toronto City Council passed a motion to rename Aquatic Park in honor of Tommy Thompson. He was the first Parks Commissioner for, of Metro Toronto Parks Department, and he served from 1955 through 1981. His achievements include the design and development of Toronto Island Park, preservation of Toronto's ravines as natural areas, and he served as director as, at the Toronto Zoo soon after it opened. He's well known for coining the term, please walk on the grass. So moving into the Tommy Thompson Park master plan process, it involved five phases, there were four goals that were established for the master planning process. To conserve and manage the natural resources and environmentally significant areas of the site, to provide a unique water-oriented open space to assist in meeting regional recreational needs, to develop public awareness of the significance of the Lake Ontario waterfront and Tommy Thompson Park, and to develop a plan for Tommy Thompson Park, which is cognizant of the policies and development proposals within the planning area. So the first phase of the master plan included establishing and evaluating planning zones. There were three options that were presented. First option was a natural resource zone. The second option was a recreation zone. So essentially in these two options, either the entire land base is used for natural resources or the entire land base is used for recreation. Option three, offered a blend of the natural resource and recreation options, as well as left some areas un unplanned for long-term development. So at the end of phase one, options one and three were selected to move into phase two, where lists of potential site uses for each option was generated, evaluated, and refined. In phase three, two conceptual plans were generated for each op option, and one was selected as the recommended concept plan. It then moved to phase four and developed into the master plan. The recommended plan was a blend of natural resource and recreation, including a number of boating facilities along the exterior of present day embayment D and vehicle access to an interpretive center at the cell one wetland. This plan was consistent with the established master plan process goals and the conservation authority's planning direction. However, throughout the public participation process, which happened at each phase, uh, at which happened multiple times during each phase of the planning process, there was opposition to this option in favor of the natural resource zone option. The Tommy Thompson Park Master Plan was approved by the Metro Toronto and Region Conservation Authority Board in 1989, and the environmental assessment was submitted to the province for approval. As noted, local interest and advocacy groups, including Friends of the Spit, Toronto Field Naturalists, and Toronto Ornithological Club, were unsatisfied with the 1989 Tommy Thompson Park Master Plan. Although the plan had been submitted for approval, the Royal Commission on the Future of the Toronto Waterfront, known as the Crombie Commission, was underway and conducting public hearings. This provided the opportunity to advocate uh, that the Tommy Thompson Park Master Plan be revised to follow the natural areas approach. Advocacy to the Crombie Commission was successful and the Tommy Thompson Park Master Plan was revised. The proposed boat clubs were removed and placed on the outer harbor, on the north shore of the outer harbor, except for the existing Aquatic Park Sailing Club, which is written into the revised Master Plan. 
Vehicle access was restricted past the main entrance and the interpretive center was relocated closer to the entrance. It's due to the dedication, determination, and strong public participation of these local interest and advocacy groups that we can celebrate the urban wilderness that Tommy Thompson Park is today. The revised Tommy Thompson Park Master Plan was approved, uh, fully approved in 1995 and has four objectives. To preserve significant species, to protect environmentally significant areas, to enhance aquatic and terrestrial habitat, and to enhance public recreational opportunities with a focus on passive recreation like bird watching, walking, jogging, and cycling. There are three main components to the master plan. Habitat, to protect, preserve, and create opportunities for wildlife. Facilities, to enhance and facilitate outreach and education programs. And trails, to provide a safe and enjoyable visitor experience on foot or bike. Habitat restoration has been a major focus of the on-the-ground work since 1995. Over $7 million has been invested into habitat creation, enhancement, protection, and rehabilitation projects covering over, over 40 hectares at Tommy Thompson Park. Aquatic habitat restoration has focused on the creation and enhancement of coastal wetlands, sheltered embayments, interior shorelines, and open coasts using approaches based on the Toronto Waterfront Aquatic Habitat Restoration Strategy. Terrestrial habitat restoration has focused on the protection, enhancement, and rehabilitation of meadow, shrubland, and successional forests, including invasive species management. The master plan facilities and trails are shown on this map, but a quick note, the orientation is funny on this map. We've shifted it so that the landscape can fit in on a landscape uh, orientation. So the north is to the left. Um, so Open Lake Ontario is at the top of the screen and the city of Toronto is roughly at the bottom of the screen. The main focus of Tommy Thompson Park, of course, is the wilderness, the vegetation and wildlife communities. So when designing buildings to facilitate, to facilitate park programming, the design and materials, concrete and core steel, were carefully selected to pay tribute to the construction history and to blend into the landscape. They're not the features, it's the wildlife and the, and the landscape that are the features. We have a fully serviced washroom pavilion at the park entrance, a nature center for interpretation and public programming, the outdoor classroom at the Cell One wetland to enhance uh, school programs and the bird research station on Peninsula D. We have limited utilities throughout the park. Um, so beyond the entrance, we have um, offline washrooms, um, mostly in the form of portable to toilets at key locations in the park. And we have a trail system as well. We have three classes of trails designed for different recreation purposes and laid out so they're, they are more heavily concentrated at the north end of the park or near the entrance compared to the south. The south end is intended to be more wild and give that wilderness uh, experience. The multi-use trail is a paved surface that runs from the parking lot to the lighthouse and is intended for all visitors. Pedestrian trails are granular surface and designed specifically for walking, and the nature trails are narrow, mown paths through natural areas, providing opportunity for close connections with nature. While well, the first phase of the master plan implementation occurred in the early 2000s, the park is still in interim management. Tommy Thompson Park um, is now shown in green, is what the lands that were transferred to Toronto and Region Conservation Authority in 1984. These lands are officially Tommy Thompson Park and uh, are jointly managed between TRCA and the City of Toronto. And finally, the remainder of this bit um, is owned by the province uh, under the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and is leased to Ports Toronto um, the current operating name of uh, what was originally the Toronto Harbour Commissioners, um, 
for the lake filling activities and, and land construction. Um, so this management or this, this ownership scenario and management scenario is why we have sort of odd public hours uh, when visiting Tommy Thompson Park. Um, access to the park uh, is restricted during essentially business hours. So Monday through Friday, the park is officially open to the public from uh, 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, because outside of these hours, um, uh, during business hours, access to the property is under care and control of Ports Toronto based on uh, their lease agreement. And now I'm going to pass it over to Hillary, who's going to speak to the ecological significance. Thanks, Andrea. Um... Can everybody see that to show that? Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> it looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, hi everyone, I'm Hillary, and um, I'm going to be talking to you about the ecological significance um, of this man-made peninsula five kilometers into Lake Ontario. Um, so uh, Tommy Thompson Park is an environmentally significant area. And this is as per the City of Toronto official plan, as it contains regionally rare species like the cottonwood trees, um, which used to be the dominant community along the waterfront. But now the largest stands are actually only found at the Toronto Islands and Tommy Thompson Park. The park also offers a large natural area in the very urban city of Toronto, um, and it connects the green spaces east and west along the waterfront, but also north through the Don Valley and up into the Oak Ridges Moraine. Um, in 2022, Tommy Thompson Park transitioned from a globally significant important bird area to a key di di biodiversity area as it supports high concentrations of several specific bird species, including double-crested cormorants, red-breasted red mergansers, ring-billed gulls, and chimney swifts. Tommy Thompson Park also provides essential habitat for breeding colonial waterbirds like the cormorants or common terns. Um, waterfowl during migration and overwintering periods, and also large concentrations of songbirds during their spring and fall migrations that use the park as a layover to rest and refuel before continuing their journeys. So through natural succession and targeted habitat restoration projects, Tommy Thompson Park has developed a diverse range of vegetation communities that change depending on when certain areas of the park were constructed and from what materials. So these vegetation communities will continue to change as natural succession progresses since the park is still relatively young. Um, that said, the park now has dune communities and forest habitat on the sandy pen uh, silty peninsulas. The various wetlands hold aquatic and emergent vegetation communities and much of the spine and top lands have now filled in with meadows and thickets. So as Andrea mentioned, um, habitat creation was a major component within the planning. Um, and as you can see in the photos, um, what was once open water and steep shorelines has now filled in with different habitat types, including 24 hectares of coastal wetlands, replacing a fraction of the historic local wetland, the Ashbridges Marsh that Karen talked about earlier. Um, and this total includes two of the three confined disposal facilities being um, turned into wetlands. So high level, we'll talk more about it in our next webinar. Um, but once cells one and two were filled to capacity, berms were built to fully enclose them. They were capped with a really fine clay and then wetlands were actually constructed on top. Water control structures were also added to these, uh, to the cells. So not only can we control the water levels within the wetlands as needed, um, they were also designed to act as fish gates with the goal of keeping common carp out of our new wetlands while allowing native fish species like bass and pike to pass through and use this new habitat. We've also created habitat in the sheltered embayments A, B, C, and D, um, with embayment D being a little bit different where we actually built a berm um, around the, ed the outer perimeter of it to enclose it from the lake, um, except for the water control structure and a coastal hemi marsh has been created in this location. In addition, over 400,000 stems have been planted at the park by staff, school groups, and through community outreach events. So thank you if you've ever participated in any of that. Um, and these include potted trees and shrubs, wildflowers, grasses, and aquatic plants like cattails and bulrushes. 
So once we've created the habitat, we can continue to work on enhancing it. And we have a couple different techniques to do this. So we incorporate large woody material to our um, habitats to add some structural complexity, but these also act as essential features for wildlife. So think perching poles for raptors or basking logs for turtles. We've also done a lot of in-water work within the near shore transitional areas between Tommy Thompson Park and the Outer Harbor, including fish cribs, sunken logs, spawning channels, and stone shoals and ledges. And all of these were designed and implemented to benefit the fish communities that travel in and around the park. As I mentioned, many, many stems have been planted at the park. And as a way to protect them, we work to install different types of fencing and predator guards so that these plants don't end up getting eaten um, by different wildlife before they actually get a chance to become established. While visiting the park, you've probably also noticed that we fence off mature trees. This is to pre protect them from being chewed by beavers. Um, we're selective about this because they also need the trees for their life cycles, but we work to try to strike a balance between the beavers thriving and maintaining our forest canopy for other species. And since vegetation communities are so young at Tommy Thompson Park, um, there aren't too many natural cavities in old trees for cavity nesting species. So we install nest boxes. So we have different size nest boxes for various species. So in, in the one photo, you'll see a smaller nest box and these are designed for songbirds like tree swallows. We also have larger um, nest boxes for waterfowl like wood ducks. Um, and we have bat roosting boxes at the park as well. Another form of enhancement that we do um, and focus on is invasive species management. So um, Tommy Thompson Park is particularly vulnerable to invasives due to its location downstream of Toronto and the Don River, but also because of the disturbed nature of the site. So because of this, invasive species management is a priority while we're working to enhance and restore habitats because these invasives threaten um, our bi the native biodiversity and in 2023, TRCA managed eight different species at the park, with our priority species being um, Phragmites australis and dog strangling vine. So we're working to create this habitat and enhance this habitat. <clears throat> and through this, Tommy Thompson now, Tommy Thompson Park now provides essential habitat for species at risk, like the monarch butterfly. So monarch butterflies are an endangered species that are becoming more at risk as a result of habitat loss the use of pesticides and invasive species. These butterflies need a really specific habitat and plant species, the milkweed, to complete their life cycles from eggs to migration. So monarch way stations are places that provide these resources so that the population can produce their next generations and complete their um, necessary migrations each year. And Tommy Thompson Park has been registered, registered as a monarch way station since 2010. And the park provides over 5,000 square feet of meadows that provide these essential um, features. So ranging from staging habitat to breeding and nectaring habitat. As I previously mentioned, um, one of our restoration priorities at the park has been management of invasive species, including dog strangling vine. So this is relevant to the monarch because this invasive vine is actually a cousin or relative to the milkweed plant and is detrimental to monarchs as the adults will actually lay their eggs on the plants. However, it is not actually a food source to the larvae and therefore they can't survive once they hatch. So we're working to um, eliminate this plant, which then opens up the opportunity to restore these areas to native habitats like meadows to continue to benefit wildlife and promote further biodiversity. More general uh, wildlife communities at the park. Um, so Tommy Thompson Park has become an amazing place for wildlife viewing in Toronto. And we have had a lot of really exciting success stories over the last couple of years from a nesting map turtle, denning foxes and coyotes. Um, we had a family of river otter this year and we had a doe and her two fawns spend the spring and summer at the park as well. This is all great news um, because an abundance of wildlife shows ecosystem function and resiliency. It helps with species persistence and recovery and it allows for increased sustainable and nature-based recreational opportunities like wildlife viewing and photography. How do we keep track of all of this? 
Um, so TRCA has aquatic and terrestrial monitoring teams that regularly monitor the wildlife communities in and around the park. We do this to better understand what species are using the space and when. So are they there um, breeding or, or foraging? And how the restoration work has benefited these species. This data can also help guide future work based on what species are in the area or if certain populations are increasing and decreasing. We also have a really great group of volunteer naturalists that are at the park year round recording their wildlife sightings and capturing amazing photos. And we use their information and their data collected to complement other data to again help guide different restoration objectives going forward. Another um, volunteer group that we have are our wildlife ambassadors. So this group of volunteers are at the park and provide outreach to park visitors to promote ethical wildlife viewing. So we also look more closely at certain species. The Tommy Thompson Park Bird Research Station is located on Peninsula D of the park and is one of 25 stations across Canada that collect regular banding and observation uh, data during spring and fall migration. So Tommy Thompson Park is a great place to study migrating birds because of its location um, into Lake Ontario. So when birds are on their way north to their breeding ground in the spring, they've just tackled Lake Ontario across or around. They stop at the park as the first place they see. They rest refuel before they continue their way further north. Vice versa happens in the fall. So the birds are heading south to their overwintering ground and they're getting ready to tackle Lake Ontario. So they stop at the park, rest, refuel, and then they can continue their journey south. So our spring migration, mo spring migration monitoring takes place from April 1st to June 9th. And then our fall migration monitoring takes place from August 5th to November 12th. During these periods, we do operate daily weather permitting. And some of the information we're collecting at the, sp at the station is species, sex, age, weight, and fat of the birds. Um, this data is then submitted into an international database to contribute to reporting on North American bird populations and trends to help guide future conservation efforts. It also helps us get a better understanding of the mi migration routes and times of birds um, and can guide restoration efforts not only locally, so at the park and in Toronto, but also internationally based on where these birds are traveling. So far, uh, 332 different species of birds have been identified at the park. And the bird research station is often a destination for park visitors. Um, if you've been at the park, you've probably seen it on Peninsula D and maybe even wandered in if you noticed that it was open. But it's also a really, really great location for students participating in education events. And with that, I will pass it on to Jasmine, who is going to talk to you all about the education and outreach at the park. Awesome. Thanks so much, Hilary. Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to be speaking to the past and present state of education engagement initiatives at Tommy Thompson Park. So to begin, we're going to start by kind of talking and referencing that Tommy Thompson Park master plan. The reason for that is because public education has always been a key component and focus of Tommy Thompson Park's core mandates. Um, so there's always been an emphasis on engaging with park visitors and developing public awareness, specifically of the significance of the Lake Ontario waterfront and of Tommy Thompson Park in particular. And there's always been an encouragement for the facilitation of environmental education and outreach. So whether this is permitting school buses to access uh, further into the park and encouraging these field trips to take place or encouraging environmental education regarding the ecology and natural succession of the landform. Um, so we're gonna start by kind of talking about the historical kind of education and engagement that has taken place at Tommy Thompson Park between the years of 1984 all the way to 2015. And so, we'll start off with the weekend interpretation program at Tommy Thompson Park. This has been running for almost 40 years. It's been offered annually since 1984, and it's still offered today. And it's the longest standing educational program taking place at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, when it was first kind of um, being developed at Tommy Thompson Park, often educators would actually use the spit cart, which some folks in the audience might remember, 
This is kind of like a modified ice cream cart that enabled uh, our educational interpreters to be mobile. And so they'd really bring educational um, kind of interpretation throughout the park and engage with park visitors on the ground um, on, a, on a weekend and holiday basis. Um, also in these years uh, became uh, the kind of inception of field trips to Tommy Thompson Park. And so occasional field trips to the park began taking place in the early and mid 2000s. Um, this involved kind of K to 12 students who would visit the park and they would take place in our aquatic plants program where they would plant aquatic plants actually in the wetlands at Tommy Thompson Park, such as Cell One, um, or they would participate in the winged migration program, which was our very first field trip program that was developed to educate students about bird migration and uh, urban ecology and was affiliated with the bird research station down at TTP. We also welcomed a number of post-secondary institutions who would come for guided experience to learn more about a variety of topics, including ornithology, habitat restoration, and vegetation communities down at TTP. Another really long-standing um, engagement initiatives at, at, at the park has been the Spring Bird Festival, and this was established all the way back in 2001. Uh, these are some pictures that were taken in 2010, and this is an annual festival that celebrates the spring bird migration that uh, and this festival takes place in May each year. Um, and you can see there are a variety of events um, that have taken, or kind of like uh, components to this festival that have taken place each year, including booths, guided hikes, and um, collaboration with the Tommy Thompson Park Bird Research Station to kind of perform this public outreach. The Butterfly Festival is a more recent addition. It was established in 2006, um, and it takes place annually in August. It celebrates the butterfly communities down at Tommy Thompson Park, especially highlighting the monarchs, which are hosted by the num large number of milkweed plants that grow at Tommy Thompson Park, in part due to some of the planting efforts that were mentioned earlier. And on the left here in this slide, we can actually see monarch butterflies doing something called staging, which is when they group together in advance of their southern migration um, in the late summer and early fall. So this is a phenomenon that can actually be witnessed at Tommy Thompson Park during this time of year, which is pretty special. Finally, in addition to the programs and events that have been hosted and delivered by TRCA staff during that time, we've been also very fortunate to work with community volunteers. Um, and these volunteers have interest and skill sets that enable them to effectively lead community programs and further engage visitors in Tommy Thompson Park including volunteer-led bird walks and nature walks and a variety of other uh, programs. So from there, we're gonna kind of move on to 2015, um, education beginning in that year and kind of all the way down to the present day where we're at today with the education and engagement and outreach initiatives that are taking place at Tommy Thompson Park. So this date of 2015 might seem kind of arbitrary, but it signifies when the expansion and growth of formal active programming taking place out of Tommy Thompson Park, kind of when it all began to get very structured and formal and regular, and when we were super a super active educational presence down at the park. Um, and so the educational programs that we run out of Tommy Thompson Park are mostly funded through a fee-for-service model and through partnership agreements. So we're really focused on trying to build financial resilience with the programs that we offer. Um, field trips are one of the kind of primary, kind of long-standing annual programs that we offer down at Tommy Thompson Park. We have a number of curriculum linked opportunities for students from grades K to 12 to come down to the park and experience the phenomenon of migration, explore Toronto's urban wildlife habitats and more. Um, and since 2015, since this kind of uh, big year, we've engaged over 30,000 participants in educational programming down at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, and this, these field trips take a number of different forms. So we can see some students planting. Um, those students in the top right corner were taking place in our aquatic plants program, which is when students actually grow plants in their classroom and bring them to Tommy Thompson Park on a, on a school bus and then plant them um, right in the water or in the, in the dirt down at Tommy Thompson Park. So really kind of school to park, kind of direct community stewardship taking place there. 
Um, we can also see students using binoculars here. So learning about um, the diversity of bird species that live down at Tommy Thompson Park, um, learning about the diversity of habitats that exist at Tommy Thompson Park, um, and all of this taking place through kind of a, a regular school field trip where they would hop on the bus and come down here. Um, so these are all still programs that we offer today, um, every single year down at the park. Something else that we've been really excited about is the growth of our summer camps down at Tommy Thompson Park. So uh, over 700 campers between the ages of six to 16 years old have attended nature camp at Tommy Thompson Park since 2018, which is when they began. And when they began at 2018, I was actually um, one of the kind of like leaders of the very first camp down at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, and there were only 18 campers that summer. We only ran for I think two weeks. Um, and now this past summer in 2023, we welcomed over 250 uh, different campers to the park. Um, so the expansion of this program is very close to my heart and very exciting to, to me, but um, it's also a, a really great example of how we've been able to kind of build nature connections with urban youth. Uh, often these are youth who really haven't had the chance to kind of spend this much time getting their hands dirty and getting into nature. Um, you can see some examples of some of the activities that we get into with our nature campers, you know, planting native plants, going on nature hikes, visiting the bird research station, really building those connections to nature. Um, through the success of our summer camp programs, we've been able to develop year round youth programming um, to kind of continue to promote the engagement of kids in the park and foster an appreciation for urban nature in year-round conditions. Um, so we can see campers in these pictures from our PA day camps, from our March break camps, our youth nature clubs, where, you know, where, whatever the nature conditions, we're getting outside and we're, we're uh, exploring nature together. Um, in addition to engaging youth, a number of our programs focus on engaging community members of all ages. So often this engagement will take the form of community stewardship. So this is where we will create opportunities for participants to engage in activities such as shrub plantings, guided hikes, invasive species removal, litter cleanups, um, and community and science. So really encouraging community members to come down to Tommy Thompson Park and kind of participate in the restoration work that's happening in the space. And this photo was taken at a shrub planting event it happened earlier this year in September. Um, with a group of English language learners from George Brown College. Um, we also run a pretty robust corporate engagement program at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, so this is where we're kind of looking to directly engage corporate groups who are looking for ways to give back to their local kind of like urban nature. And so these programs run under the Look After Where You Live brand. Um, and we kind of market it as a team building program um, where we can get folks out and get them to understand their local environment and how they can make that direct impact. Um, in 2022, we had eight groups come out to the park. And then this past year in 2023, we welcomed 18 groups um, who participated in, in stewardship based programs down at Tommy Thompson Park. And you can see one of those groups <laughs> in the photos, very proud of the shrubs that they just planted. Um, so including uh, all of this, this corporate engagement and community engagement in 2023, we planted over 1500 shrubs uh, down at Tommy Thompson Park, which is an estimated 3000 meters square that were restored through uh, the, the efforts of our community. Uh, community stewardship and corporate engagement, these programs can often be very kind of private and tailored events, but something that we're working on expanding is the number of programs that are public and family oriented for all ages. So these include things like our guided nature hikes, um, art in the park programs, learning, learn to fish programs, um, which we offered a number of uh, throughout the summer, spring and summer this year, our quad cycle rentals. Uh, I don't know if you've been to the park recently and, and seen these out in action, um, but we began to rent these out on the weekends for the past few years. And uh, they enable uh, park visitors to kind of access deeper into Tommy Thompson Park. So we're really kind of thinking of them as a way to make the park more accessible for uh, park visitors who might not be able to walk all the way to, um, all the way into the park. Um, 
Our winter solstice series is a event series that we're currently hosting down at Tommy Thompson Park where we're celebrating the winter solstice, which is taking place very soon in a few weeks. Um, we host owl prowl events at, at the park, snowshoe programs, and many more. And so really we're continuing to expand on diverse programming opportunities for folks of all backgrounds, interests, and experience levels with being outdoors. Uh, we found that often meeting people where they're at is essential and then encouraging their engagement and excitement about nature through tapping into their kind of unique prior interests, um, such as with our Art in the Park program, we found that these are ways that we can really get people excited about Toronto's urban wilderness, Tommy Thompson Park, um, and advocating for uh, this space. These are a number of kind of newer programs that we offer down at the park. Uh, but a number of long-standing programs are still being offered, including the signature festivals. And so this past year, we hosted the Spring Bird Festival on May 13th and the Butterfly Festival on August 19th. And over 2,000 participants attended these festivals this year. Um, and we hosted a variety of booths, activities, guided hikes, uh, and presentations uh, celebrating the kind of ecological diversity uh, down at the park. These are annual events, so stay tuned for 2024 uh, for those dates to be released. Uh, and of course, the Weekend Interpretation Program at Tommy Thompson Park, that longest standing program is still occurring. This past year in 2023, we've engaged with uh, about 13,500 park visitors. Um, so that number of park visitors were able to come down to Tommy Thompson Park and uh, access this free interpretation about TTP's natural history, ask questions, and kind of participate in the parks community. So we really hope to see you soon. Um, I've mentioned a number of programs and a number of ways to get involved and get outside. Um, and I encourage everyone to visit our website, tommythompsonpark.ca. You can uh, look at those headings, events, education, camps, and that's where you can really find out more about some of the programs that we're offering. Um, and we'd love to see you come out and, and participate. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jasmine. So I think that wraps up our speaker portion of the evening. So thank you to all of our speakers for sharing um, their wealth of knowledge with everyone here today. At this point, we'll pivot into our live Q&A session. Um, so I will start looking through the Q&A panel for those questions. I did notice um, a few questions also come in through the chat, so I'll try to address those as well as we go through this Q&A. But this is an opportunity for everyone um, to get their questions in in the Q&A um, because we're we're just going to be reading them and, and, and taking quite a bit of time to, to answer some of your great questions. Um, I think the first question here that came in was um, about longshore drift. So the question was, longshore drift is permanently interrupted for the Toronto Islands. How exactly is this problem being addressed since sand and clay from the Scarborough Bluffs seem now to be deposited at Ashbridge's Bay? So I'll turn this question over to Karen to answer for us. Thanks, Tisha. It's a very good question. So there's a couple of ways that this lack of sand is being addressed. First of all, regarding Ashbridge's Bay and the deposition into um, the bay that exists now, um, TRCA is working with the City of Toronto to create a new Ashbridge's Bay landform. That's going to extend the tip of what is now Ashbridge's Bay Park so that it comes out a little bit far further. And by doing so, the sand will bypass that uh, the mouth of that bay and we will no longer have as much sand deposition in what's called Coatsworth Cut as we used to. What this doesn't do is it doesn't address the lack of sand that is needed to keep the Toronto Islands nourished in terms of their beach dune system. So TRCA undertook a project uh, that started in 2019 called the Gibraltar Point Erosion Control Project, which involved the creation of a groin at the tip of Gibraltar to catch the sand that is, come, the, the remaining sand that is being 
uh, uh, drifted across the waterfront and that resulted in the natural restoration of that beach on the south shore of Gibraltar. But the sand doesn't make its way around the corner, so to speak, to Hanlon's uh, south or Gibraltar north. And so as a result of that, we had to barge in 55,000 tons of sand to recreate that beach dune system. And it was a big success. The project is only just completed. We finished our last planting just this past season in, in the fall. And what we'll be doing is monitoring that over time and adaptively managing the sand there. So um, our coastal engineers have estimated that we, were, we will be required to feed the beach or add sand nourishment to the system about every five years or so, but we're going to see what the system does. And when it needs sand, we'll have to import sand and, uh, and hopefully that keeps the whole system running. Great. Thanks so much for that answer, Karen. That sounds like a, a, a huge undertaking, um, but it sounds like the right people are on it. So that's fantastic. Um, another question here um, is asking about how the issues with contaminants are being addressed um, at TTP. So I wonder, Karen, if you could speak to that a little bit too. Sure. That's another really good question. And the issue of contaminants is really pre-1978. So the material that came in after that is, is, is clean material. So in the cells, because this, I should say clean material except for the cells. So the material that came from the harbor um, is contaminated and that material goes into the cells. And we're gonna talk about this more in our next webinar, but essentially TRCA created a, 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 a sent, a, a a soil cap on top of this material. So that way it keeps it biologically unavailable. And then we built a wetland on top. And you'll hear about that more in the new year. Um, for the rest of the site, um, most of the area has been dealt with by its final surface treatment. So that was new clean imported soil that was brought in. In the areas like the baselands where we know they didn't bring in a whole lot more material, uh, we have been in contact with Toronto Public Health and given the good vegetation coverage that is on the baselands right now, there is no big concerns for human health related to um, uh, exposure to those toxic soils. That's really great. I actually think um, there is another question related to contaminants, so I might jump ahead to that one. Um, wondering if there is still remaining contamination from the park's original construction. In particular, is the water tested regularly? So just wondering if we could even speak to some of that water um, testing or water quality monitoring. Yeah, we test the water in our cells regularly. So cells one and two, those are the completed uh, restored wetland cells. Um, the rest of the material, as I said, is biologically unavailable, so there isn't a great deal of concern right now for those contaminants. Okay, that's great. Um, perfect. Uh, I might, since we're, we mentioned the cells, there's a question here about the cells, wondering which are still available according to, to the plan. So maybe, um, Andrea, you could speak to that a little bit, or, or, or Hillary. Uh, yeah, I can. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, yes. Sorry, so as I, as I mentioned, cell one and two were both filled to capacity and they were actually filled to capacity um, with the dredge material pre-2000 and have since been decommissioned with the cap um, and the wetlands have been created on top. Cell three, however, is significantly larger and is still an active confined disposal facility. So that cell three is still accepting um, dredge material. Okay, thank you, that's a, that's a great update. And yes, if you've been to Tommy Thompson Park, you know how massive cell three is. So, so you'll um, it's it's not a surprise that there's still space in cell three. Um, there's a really great question here about chimney swifts. Um, Jeff wants to know: Are there any known nesting sites for chimney swifts in the area? I know they have very specific requirements for nesting locations. Um, Karen, did you want to take this one? 
Sure. I love chimney swifts. Um, <laughs> chimney swifts are such a cool bird because they lack the ability to perch. Instead, they have to cling to vertical surfaces. So they need, historically, before there were chimneys, they would have nested in large diameter hollow trees. But of course, when European settlers arrived, those were largely deforested, but they readily took up to chimneys, which was a really good compromise because at the time when uh, swifts need to nest in the spring and summer, chimneys aren't in use, so it's not a problem. And you can, in fact, find chimney swifts in some of our downtown chimneys. One of the best known sites is the Moss Park Armory on Queen Street. So if you head to Birds Canada site and look for Swift Watch, they typically have a Swift Watch viewing party every spring so that you can see all of the swifts descend into that roost chimney, and I highly recommend it. Um, there's also other buildings downtown and I think that being part of that Swift Watch program, you can help identify those chimneys so they can be protected. I've heard some really great stories about the Swift Watch parties. <laughs> so, so yeah, I would also second that recommendation. I've heard it's a wonderful like display. Thanks so much for that question. Um, there are a few more questions here in in the Q and A and also in the chat, so we'll get to those. And again, any anyone still um, on the call with us, if you have any other questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Actually, before I go into another question, there was a comment here um, from Heather. I think in response to your um, answer about the um, the uh, the sand moving uh, around, you know the um, the islands. Um, Heather mentioned that if people are interested in issues regarding sand, erosion, and much more like international trade, scarcity, and types, that they recommend uh, the documentary Sand Wars. Always down for a good documentary recommendation. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that uh, out loud. So thanks so much for that recommendation. Um, there is a question here about programs. Um, are there any plans to improve access to the park? So I think we all know it's a long walk from the TTC bus stops to the park entrance. And when it's windy or hot, it seems much longer, um, let alone to the far points of the park. Um, I, I don't know, maybe this is a question for Andrea. Sure. Um, so in terms of TTC access, um, that's not, um, not something I'm aware of um, potentially happening. Um, but uh, in, in, sorry, within the park itself, um, the best uh, suggestions that we have right now are to participate in the quad cycle program offered mm -hmm. on weekends during the summer. Um, or we also have, um, there is the, um, uh, the bike share program. Um, there's a station, uh, bike share station available in the parking lot um, so that bikes are available to visitors. Thanks for pointing out that bike share um, station. It was previously located further within the park, but now they've moved it to the parking lot. And I think that makes it a lot more accessible. So hopefully that that helps some of you get out and enjoy the park. It's definitely um, really, really fun by bike ride. So thank you so much for that question. Um, I don't see uh, much more in the way of questions um, through here. There was a question in the chat that I wanted to bring up for, for Jasmine. Um, and it was, uh, I've been fascinated about the seven owl species I've found in Toronto over the years. I would like to join an owl prowl. And I guess this is a question that could apply to any other um, of those fabulous events that you've mentioned earlier. Um, where can I find out times and register for these programs? Awesome. Yeah, that's a great question. So we are kind of currently in the planning stages for the suite of programming that we're hoping to offer in 2024 down at Tommy Thompson Park. So as these dates uh, and programs are finalized, they'll be posted online um, to the Tommy Thompson Park website on our events calendar. So that'll really be the best place to go to access more information about these programs and to um, actually go ahead and sign up and register. So great to hear that you're excited about the owl diversity um, down at Tommy Thompson Park. We definitely are too. Thanks, I wanted to make sure that we got that plug in for some of our upcoming programs. <laughs> um, there was a question in the chat that I almost missed. So I will, well, let's address that now. And it's about the double-crusted cormorants at Tommy Thompson Park. 
How does the present master plan handle double crested cormorants and the complaints from the public about the trees that are being killed by them being there? Great question. It is. Uh, yeah. So um, cormorants started nesting at Tommy Thompson Park in 1990, and they are a really important species for the park. And so we are going to give them um, a lot of focus in one of our future webinars um, that we're planning for May. We're going to focus on birds. And so we'll go into great detail about the cormorant management strategy during that webinar. Um, but just a sort of Cole's note version of, uh, of that presentation is that, yes, we have, uh, we have a healthy population of double crested cormorants that nest at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, they do, they are ecosystem engineers sort of like our beaver friends. And so they do have a negative impact on the health of the trees within the park. So um, back in 2007, 2008, TRCA worked to uh, develop a cormorant management strategy for Tommy Thompson Park. And so we've been actively implementing that strategy since 2009. Um, we've had some great success with it in that we have um, successfully altered the nesting behavior of uh, most of the birds. Um, up to 80% of the birds are now nesting on the ground rather than nesting in trees. So they're not impacting the tree health. That said, since 2009, there has been a significant amount of tree loss. Um, most of those trees were already dead and dying back in 2009 when the strategy began. Um, so we'll go into much more detail um, in the May webinar, so stay tuned. And uh, yeah, we love questions about cormorant. Thanks so much. Yes, we we do. And, and I, yes, a great plug for our May TTP talk, which will focus largely on the birds that that call Tommy Thompson Park home. Um, there's a question here about volunteering. How can you volunteer at TTP? And so maybe I'll throw that over to you, Hillary. Yeah, um, great question. So we, depending on the season, we are um, recruiting volunteers for our various programs, um, mostly in the spring and summer. Um, so if you're interested, you can head to the TRCA website and the Get Involved tab, and all the volunteer programs will be posted there. Um, so if we have openings for volunteers at our bird research station or volunteer naturalists or wildlife ambassadors, you can find those postings there. Um, in the meantime, if you have program specific questions, you can reach out to me directly. Um, and then uh, there's nothing posted yet, but keep your eyes peeled for the spring. Thanks, Hillary. And I'll also chime in that come um, kind of closer to the spring, we'll also be looking for volunteers at some of our educational programming as well. We'll be looking for pro uh, volunteers for our camp programs and our youth programs and uh, some of our signature events, maybe community planting events as well. Um, and so there should be a wide variety of volunteer um, opportunities depending on your interests and skill sets. Um, so definitely keep your eyes peeled for those postings. Fantastic. Thanks so much for plugging that. I just saw a really lovely comment in the chat that I just wanted to mention, uh, maybe to round off our evening. But um, Jim, in, in the comments or in the chat mentioned, thank you for your presentations. I've been a visitor since 1989, and I can't imagine life without it. And I feel like all of us here um, probably feel the very, very same. So with that, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for our first TTP Talks. Um, again, we were so excited to share, um, you know, this park with all of you. For maybe some of you in the audience who haven't been to Tommy Thompson Park before, we recommend coming by for a visit, maybe checking out one of our community public events that are going on to get um, a first look at, at the park. Um, if you have any questions follow like follow up about about the presentation I don't know if we like I don't think we got to everything um but if you have any follow-up questions please direct them to ttp at trca.ca um you know we'll have members of our panel there who can who can follow up directly with you on on your question and also keep an eye on your inbox for our follow-up email um, we'll be sending a follow-up email within the next couple of days, which will contain a link to the recording so that you can share the recording with folks who maybe weren't able to join us or folks that you um, want 
to um, introduce Tommy Thompson Park to. Um, we'll also include a short feedback survey as well. And like we've mentioned a couple times, um, our next TTP talk will be happening in the new year, specifically in the last week of February 2024. And it will be on the topic of habitat restoration. So if that interests you, we hope to see you again at our next TTP talk. All right, so we will leave you all to the rest of your evenings. Thanks again for joining us and, and have a fantastic um, evening and rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Bye.